Good evening, and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, Famous Kidnappings and How They Were Solved, with Waltham author Joanna Schaffhausen. My name is Deborah Hoffman, and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before we start, I want to let you know how the evening will go. Um, Joanna will do a, an approximately 40-minute presentation about famous kidnappings, and then she'll field questions. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time, and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Joanna Schaffhausen is the acclaimed author of the Ellery Hathaway Mystery Series. Her new book, Every Waking Hour, is out now. Over to you, Joanna. Thanks, Deborah. It's great to be here. The Waltham Public Library is the library I grew up in, so it's near and dear to my heart. I used to take out 20 books a week because that's as many as they would let me. And I would walk them home to my house and I read them and I'd come back a week later for a fresh 20 set of books. <laughs> I think I read uh, pretty much every book that was available <laughs> at one point. So thrilled to be here. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen so that everybody can see it. Let's see. One participant can share at a time. All right, there we go. Share. All right, hopefully people can see that. I'm going to be talking tonight about some crazy true crime kidnappings. Like you have to like see it to believe it. it these are some nutty things that went happened went, went down. Um, so first, uh, some kidnapping statistics. It's interesting. The FBI actually only kind of sort of keeps track of kidnappings. I was surprised to learn this myself when I went looking to try to find out like, well, how many people in the United States get kidnapped? Um, and the ones they track most closely are kids. If you wanna find out about like how many adults get kidnapped, it, good luck. Um, there are about 600 adults who are go missing um, every year, they keep that. And to be tracked by the FBI is missing you have to be missing for a little while, you know, not 24 hours. And there has to be like a good reason why somebody thinks you could be missing. Um, no super obvious place you might be. Um, but still, the vast majority of adults who are reported to the FBI as missing are not are abduct, abducted, kidnapped, missing. They're not actually missing. They went somewhere and people like their families just don't know where they are. Um, so it's a small percentage of these cases that are actual kidnappings or even missing people. Um, and kids, so of the kids who are kidnapped, only 1% of kids who go missing are actually abducted. So it's a pretty small number. And of that 1%, the vast majority of those are actually kidnapped by their parents or relatives. Um, so it's not a stranger abduction. Only about three a year are actually abducted by strangers. Um, sometimes it's a little more, sometimes often it's a little less. It's really super rare for a child to be um, abducted by a stranger. Um, this is the premise of my current book, Every Waking Hour, involves the potential kidnapping of a 12-year-old girl from the common in Boston during a big fair. She, her nanny, she's there with her nanny, she goes to get a snack and just disappears into the ether. And so one of the questions is, which category does she fall into? Is she just ran away, like off having an adventure or was she actually abducted? So um, my heroine Ellery Hathaway has to figure that out. Um, and then there's virtual kidnappings, which is something that is on the rise with today's technology. The FBI has actually issued some warnings about this. Um, and I will talk more about what this is at the end and how you can protect yourself because you could be a victim of virtual kidnapping. So kidnapping motives, these are the three most common. The first, as I mentioned, are non-custodial parents or relatives abducting their own children. So this is like the parents get divorced, one parent has custody, the other wants custody or wants the kids and they abduct them or the grandparents abduct them or something like that. So the vast majority of kids who are abducted are actually taken by relatives. 
Um, the second one is ransom demand, which is the classic that you see on TV. You know, I have your loved one, give me a million dollars or if you want to see them again. Um, this is pretty rare in the United States. It's more common in places like South America. Um, and I'll get back to that too. Um, but still overall, pretty unusual. And then part of a larger motive like murder or pedophilia, where this is the, the kind of kidnapping that has the least good outcome. Um, and like, for the kids who are abducted by strangers, they generally fall into this category. Um, and unfortunately, they tend not to be alive very long after they are taken. But fortunately, very rare. All right, we are actually gonna talk about adults today, not kids, despite the focus of my uh, book. And the first one is the strange case of Robert Wiles. So Robert Wiles uh, was a 26 year old um, pilot living in Florida in 2009 when he went missing. Um, so at 3 a.m., this guy named Toby Holt gets a call. So Toby works for uh, National Aviation Services, where Robert Wiles also works. So Robert's uh, father, Tom, owns the company. And Tom lives in Ohio. And Toby and uh, Robert both work out of the airplane hangar in Florida. So this is why at 3 a.m. Toby Holt gets an alarming phone call from Tom from Ohio and he says I need you to get to the airplane hangar immediately. You have to let in the FBI. My son Robert is in trouble. And so Robert was supposed to show up at a trade show in Texas in Dallas and he didn't show up. This is now several days have gone by, nobody knows what's happened to him. And his dad, pictured here with his mom, gets a ransom demand. So what happens is he gets a um, text on his phone and it's from his son Robert's phone. And it says, read your email, read your work email right now. So uh, Tom goes and checks his work email and he finds there an email purportedly from his son, Robert. But the text says, uh, we have your son, Robert. And if you want him alive, you have to do exactly what we tell you. Um, you have to take $750,000 in small bills, put it in a piece of luggage, put the luggage in a cardboard box and put it in Robert's office at the airplane hangar in Florida. So Tom's in Ohio. So he needs like a man on the street in Florida. So he calls up his buddy, his most trusted associate, Toby, and says, will you help the FBI? Of course, the ransom note says, don't call the FBI. But cleverly and correctly, uh, Tom does in fact engage the authorities right away. And so Toby goes and meets the FBI at the hangar. Um, there's no sign of any trouble at the hangar. They don't see any sign that Robert's been taken anywhere. The only weird thing is his truck is still in the parking lot and he was supposed to be in Dallas. Like what's his truck doing here? But there's no blood, no trace of him, no signs of a struggle, no signs that anybody broke and entered. Um, so the FBI decides, well, we'll we'll pretend that we're going through with the demand for Robert's life and we will put, um, this is clever, they put coffee in the luggage <laughs> instead of money, <laughs> about the same weight. And then they put it in the cardboard box and they left it in Robert's office and they put surveillance on it to see who claimed it. And no one did. They like waited for a couple days, the deadline came and went, nobody came to get the money. So it was already pretty weird, right? Like why would uh, the kidnappers say, put it in his office? Why not like leave it in a mailbox somewhere or drop it in a parking lot? Like it just, it didn't make a lot of sense. And so the FBI started wondering if maybe the ransom demand is a smoke screen and there's another reason why Robert has gone missing. 
So they're, one of their initial suspects is Robert himself. Could he have faked his own kidnapping? I mean, the texts that are coming to his father are from Robert's phone. And uh, when word got out that he was missing, um, a hairdresser came forward, um, somebody who cut Robert's hair. And she had a very strange story. She said, not long ago, Robert came in, she was cutting his hair and he was really chatty. And he said, I'm not liking my job. He's a young guy and um, he just got graduated and he's put to work at his dad's company. And his dad's like, he's the heir apparent. This is gonna be the guy who's taken over. Um, give him lots of responsibility. He has to make his own way. Uh, and so maybe Robert didn't like having all this responsibility at such a young age. Maybe he didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps uh, running the National Aviation Services. Um, and indeed the hairdresser says like he hated his job and that he had a new friend and the friend said, I can get you out of it. You can fake your own kidnapping. And the hairdresser's like, what are you talking about? And he says, he has a way. I can fake my own kidnapping and then I can start my own fishing business, which is what I really wanna do. Shh, don't tell anybody. So this is really weird. So now the FBI starts looking around for any evidence that Robert Wiles could have disappeared himself. That would explain like why he didn't show up for the money. Like it was never really about the money. He just wanted to escape his life. Uh, so they look to see if anybody's used his passport anywhere, if he's used any of his credit cards, anything like that. They find um, the only activity is his cell phone was active a couple of days after he disappeared, but no credit cards. He didn't withdraw any money. Um, they trace the phone to Orlando and then it went silent and they find no sign of Robert in Orlando. Uh, this is really weird. So now they're back to worrying that something could have happened to Robert and that the motive all along was somebody wants to do something bad to Robert. Um, but who could it be? So they start looking at the National Flight Services. You can see some of them there in the picture gathered around. Um, the business is worth millions of dollars. It's very successful. And, and uh, Tom, as the owner, made it very clear uh, that, you know, his son that he brought on was going to be the big guy now, you know, like, it was a very strange situation where they, Tom wanted the people to be tough on Robert so he could prove himself, but also like he was the boss's son. So the, some of the employees were not so keen on having the boss's son um, coming in and strutting around and acting like he was now in charge. Um, and they started like filtering and complaints back up through the ranks about they didn't like the way that Robert was handling this or that. Um, and one guy stood out right away. Um, and his name was Steve Lindsay. Um, he had a drug and alcohol problem. And uh, he clashed with Robert pretty quick, soon before Robert disappeared. Um, and Robert had threatened to fire him. Um, and then when they start looking around, like where did, where did the Steve Lindsay go? Steve's disappeared. <laughs> Um, they're trying to figure out what happened to him, but the company had given him uh, a flight where they prepaid him and he was supposed to show up somewhere and then he just didn't. So he's gone AWOL now and now it looks really suspicious for Steve Lindsay. And they put out a lookout for Steve and, his, and they go to his place, he's not there. Um, they're looking for his truck and they find the truck and they pull it over and behind the wheel is a drug dealer. And like, uh, Steve gave me this truck um, in payment for drugs. <laughs> and now they're like, okay, so Steve is really desperate for money. Maybe he really did do something to Robert trying to collect money from his dad um, for drugs or other debts that he might have. And so now the search is really on to turn up Steve. So they eventually find Steve. He's in the middle of a bender, um, like coked out of his mind. Uh, and they question him and it becomes clear that this guy is a loser who doesn't really know, you know, his butt from his elbow and he's not some mastermind and they put him out of their mind. Um, so they go back to the one piece of evidence they have, which is 
his cell phone. Um, they can see the moment that the cell phone went through the booth and they can see the car that was going through when the cell phone went through and it belongs to Toby Holt, who's been their inside man, the guy who helped them with the ransom, the most trusted employee. And they're like, huh, what's this? So now they start questioning Toby and looking at his actions in the last few days. So Toby went to Home Depot and he made some interesting purchases there. Toby purchased plastic sheeting and duct tape, which is like your murder kit, right? And then they also find it, he was making some calls about trying to replace the barrel of his gun. And this is interesting because you that'll change the markings on the gun. So you can't match it if you recover a bullet and try to match it to that gun, it's not gonna match anymore because the barrel's been swapped out. So they start thinking that maybe Toby has something to do with this. They ask to search his car, the car is clean, um, but it, they also um, start looking more closely at Toby's cell phone. And what they find is Toby's cell phone and Robert's cell phone travel the same path in those two days when Robert went missing. They're pinging at the, off the same towers at the same time, both going to Orlando. And the interesting thing is they're never active at the same time. So when Robert was texting, Toby was not texting. When Toby was on the phone, Robert's phone was silent. Um, and so they decide they have enough evidence to charge Toby with uh, Robert's kidnapping and probable murder. And there he is, you can see him. He's now wearing the great prison orange. So after he disappeared, I'm, I should not say Tom, Tom's the dad. Four years after Robert disappeared, Toby was convicted of manslaughter and extortion, but the bodies, Robert's body's never been found. Um, to this day, the FBI is still looking for information and Toby's still claiming he's innocent and had nothing to do with this. And it was all some big misunderstanding. Uh, but he got 30 years and he's not likely to get out anytime soon. All right, so here's the next one, which is Every Woman's Nightmare, the strange tale of Quinn Gray. So this is Quinn and her husband Reed and their two daughters. They also lived in Florida, which I think is one of the lessons here, which is um, don't live in Florida, you might get kidnapped. Um, so they live in Florida in a $4 million home. Uh, and one day, Tom's at work when he gets a very, or excuse me, why am I with Tom? Reed, Reed's at work and he gets a very alarming phone call. It's Quinn. And she says, I've been kidnapped, you need to go home. So he races home and he finds this ransom note. You can see it there, that's the actual note. Um, and it says she's been kidnapped and they want $50,000. Um, they've taken her from the house. And so Reed is like, oh no, what the heck? Uh, he, he arranges for his daughters to stay with neighbors. You know, it's the usual, don't tell the authorities, you know, they'll kill me. Uh, please just get the 50,000 uh, for my safe return. So uh, again, smartly, Reed does not listen and immediately calls the sheriff. Uh, and they say, all right, we're gonna try to get her back. We're gonna do the exchange. So the note says, go to this Chick-fil-A and drop the money in the parking lot. So Reed gets some money together. I don't think it was 50,000, but 10,000, some money. Uh, puts it in the bag and he drives to the Chick-fil-A with the authorities surveilling and following. So he's driving around waiting for the further instructions about exactly where he's supposed to leave it. And when the phone rings, it's Quinn and she's panicked. And she says, they're on to you. They know the authorities are watching. What are you doing? You're going to get me killed. Get out of there. So he drives home and the, you know, he's like, oh God, the kidnappers are watching us. What, who even are these people? Um, so now they don't know what they're going to do. And meanwhile, Quinn's mother, Gail, has arrived on the scene. 
Um, so her name's Gail Sykes and she's terrified for her daughter and she's willing to do anything um, to get Quinn back, including deal with the kidnappers. And the kidnappers are like, great, we prefer dealing with this woman to Quinn's husband, Reed, we'll deal with Gail. Um, and so they set up a new exchange and they tell um, Gail to drive to this gas station. And when she gets there, there's another note um, that from, again, in Quinn's handwriting saying, ditch your cell phone. Um, you're going to put the money in a bag and you're going to drop it off at like some crab shack in the parking lot. Um, so, you know, don't let the authorities follow you. So the authorities are, you know, hanging back a little farther. They're still surveilling. They're not stupid, but they're not following as closely. So Gail does what she's told and she goes to the crab shack. She's got the money in a bag. She drops it off and leaves. So now the FBI is waiting to see who will pick up the money. So they're waiting there and the strangest thing happened. Three guys come along and they pick up the money and they look at it in the bag and they take it with them and they get in their car and they start driving around. Um, and so the FBI is like, we've got them, we've got the kidnappers and they're following and um, they're waiting to see like, will the kidnappers lead them to where Quinn is? But the kidnappers start sort of driving kind of randomly around the city and they're like, what? what on earth, who are these people? And then they pull into a gas station, the, the kidnappers, and the FBI is waiting, wondering like, should we make the move? What are they doing? And to their surprise, um, the local cops show up. The kidnappers called the cops. So now they're like, what? Because the FBI didn't want the local cops to know, like the sheriff's office knew, but like the local patrol people, they didn't know anything about this whole kidnapping thing. The fewer people that knew, the better. So the would-be kidnappers called the cops themselves. And it turns out they're not kidnappers. They are three random uh, college students. They're German exchange students who happened to find the money in the parking lot, stumbled across this big bag of money and were initially like, yay, it's our, you know, best day ever. We've just made thousands of dollars. And they hop in their car and they're getting ready to take off. And as they're driving, they're like, shoot, um, this is probably drug money. The drug dealers are going to want it. And then they notice they're being followed, of course, by the FBI. So they're making all these turns to say, you know, suss out that they're being followed. So now they're convinced that the car behind them is going to blow their heads off trying to get their money back. So they call the cops and they say, help, the drug dealers are following us and they want the money. And we're going to be at this gas station. Come get us. And of course, there were no drug dealers. It was the FBI. So meanwhile, the actual kidnappers call up the mom, Gail's mom, or uh, Gail, Quinn's mom, and they say, where's our money? And she's like, I gave it to you. And they're like, no, you didn't. Because <laughs> the exchange students intervened and they picked up the money. And so now the kidnappers are really starting to get annoyed. And they're like, you, you didn't drop off the money. Quinn's going to get it. So the FBI decides to get a little aggressive. The kidnappers don't know about the exchange student um, and that what happened to the money. So the FBI is like, we think you have the money. You're just trying to get more and you're not holding up your end of the deal. Give us Quinn, we gave you the money. So the kidnapper gets all angry. There's a gunshot on the kidnapper's end and the mom is like, oh my God, I have screwed this up and I have killed my poor daughter. She's never gonna see her children again. This is so awful. Things are really not looking good for Quinn at this point. But then the next day, returned. So she says she's dropped off out of a white van. Her kidnapper held her in a warehouse most of the time, but at one point moved her to a hotel. She has some minor injuries on her hands. This is the actual photo they took of her, um, trying to see like what injuries she can have. And if you zoom in, you can see like she has some minor scratches on her wrists and her ankles. And she says that's from the zip ties where they were holding her. Um, so the FBI is really keen to 
get her story and to find the kidnappers. And she says she was in her home when um, three Albanians came in, these men, and they were wearing like ski masks and rubber kitchen gloves and they abducted her from the house and they wanted this money. So they, uh, they start looking for the kidnapper. And the first suspect that Quinn gives them is her husband, Reed. And she says, actually, we were having some issues in the marriage. We were separated for a time. It, you know, he saw other people. I saw other people. Um, then we got back together. And I think, you know, he just wants all the money for himself and he wanted me out of the way. So I think he may have arranged for me to be kidnapped. So the FBI starts taking a really close look at Reed. Um, but Reed was at work. They find no evidence when they go through his electronic records that he's been in touch with anybody who could conceivably be a kidnapper. Um, but there is one weird wrinkle that stands out to them. And that is $50,000 isn't a lot to ask. You know, like he lives in a $4 million house. Like why $50,000? If you're ransoming this poor woman, like going in and abducting her from the house is high stakes crime. And now you just want 50,000. Turns out 50,000 is a, is a price that had come up in uh, the gray marriage before. And Quinn had asked Reed to pay her $50,000 to leave the marriage. And he said, nope. So put a pin in that. So this suspect, the, the one who did the talking and, and held her the most time is this uh, sketch you see here. This is the description that Quinn said of the kidnapper. This is what he looked like um, and is the description that, uh, that she gave them. So they also question her very closely, trying to find as much information out about where she was held, what was happening, the, what did the kidnapper do? And they also got another ransom note. <laughs> like she's back now, um, but the kidnappers are trying one more time and they're like, we got you once, we can get you again, give us our $50,000. And the FBI is like, this is the strangest kidnapping we've ever seen. Um, no, nobody's gonna give you your $50,000. We have Quinn back, she's safe. I, it's very strange. Um, and also there's some stuff in the note about how awful Reed is as a husband, which is kind of strange for a kidnapper to care about. Um, but one of the things that Quinn says is that when he was driving her around and they moved to the hotel, they also stopped at Publix, the grocery store, and that the kidnapper went in and got some food there. And the cops are like, great, because you know what is in grocery stores? Cameras. So we can get an idea of where he was and what he looks like. So sure enough, uh, they have a hot lead from Publix. They go, they look at the security camera. It's kind of grainy here, but they do see, like Quinn said, he shows up when she said, and he does look as she described. He's, you know, 20s, 30s, five, feet, five eight to six feet. Um, he's got dark hair, brown eyes, and they put out his picture all over the media and say, this is the man wanted for kidnapping this poor housewife. And then another strangest thing happened. He turns himself in. So uh, Jasmine Esmanovich uh, came to the police station and said, uh, I'm the guy, you can see this is a picture of him. He looks very like the man that Quinn described as her kidnapper. And he says, but I'm not a kidnapper. Uh, I was at the Publix, but I don't know this Quinn woman. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and he truthfully seems like an odd kidnapper. Like he's college educated. Um, he works at a car repair shop. He has a good job. Uh, he's never really been in trouble with the law before. Um, he's Bosnian, not Albanian. Um, and he turned himself in, he came in, he saw his face on the news and he went and he says, uh, that's me, but I'm not a kidnapper. So now the plot is looking really weird. Um, but 
on the negative side for uh, Ismanovic here, um, they go to his car repair shop and it looks like the place that um, Quinn described as the place she was held. Uh, but Quinn, they're still interviewing her and uh, her story is, is pretty odd. Like it has some, some weird twists. She says that he held her there um, and there was this blanket, a striped blanket, which you can see in the picture. And she says that uh, he made her have sex with him over and over on the blanket and that she um, almost enjoyed it. And the police are like, this is a strange thing to say, but they're looking around. So in some cases it matches the description, but they don't find any zip ties or any other signs that she was actually held there. So then they find um, also a, a call from the Emerson Inn who says, oh yeah, those people you put on the news, they stayed here. And Quinn's like, yeah, yeah, that's the place where he took me. We, when we moved to the hotel, it was the Emerson Inn. And the Emerson Inn guy is like, yeah, they were here, but it wasn't a guy and um, his kidnapping victim. It was a couple, like they were laughing and joking around and uh, like she didn't seem afraid and wasn't trying to run away. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So they take this evidence back to Ismanovic and he's like, okay, yeah, see, here's the deal. Um, actually, we were having an affair and Quinn had this idea about how we could get money out of her husband is that we would fake her kidnapping. And I have uh, audio recordings to prove it. So I guess Ismanovic sensed that the double cross might be coming for him because he had recordings of them checking into the hotel and laughing and joking around. He had recordings of them having sex. Uh, he had all the tapes. Uh, and when he finally produces them, Quinn is arrested and she is charged with extortion alongside Ismanovic. Um, and he claims it was her idea the whole time. Um, and she says, no, there really was a kidnapping. Like I was just playing along with him to try to uh, stay alive, but I was actually very afraid um, and he made me do all these things. And initially uh, her husband believed her and stood by her. And they're like, she's mentally ill. She has bipolar disorder. So maybe like she, like her emotions didn't match what she was really feeling. Um, but in the end, um, it, nobody, the, the jury didn't believe it, uh, that she was not guilty. They thought she had indeed planned her own kidnapping. They had been having an affair. Um, they were both sentenced to probation and, uh, Quinn had to repay the $90,000 that the authorities spent, um, investigating her fake kidnapping. Uh, her husband divorced her. She since is remarried and divorced again. She currently works as a yoga instructor in Florida. So if you really want to, you can move down to Florida and take yoga lessons from Quinn Gray, the kidnapping victim who wasn't actually kidnapped. Um, so I'm gonna close with a quick word about virtual kidnappings, which are on the rise and probably the most likely form of kidnapping that you could find yourself involved in. And it's a new twist on a frightening scam. So what is it? Virtual kidnapping is when one day you get a text or a phone call and it looks like it's coming from your loved one's phone. Um, their number pops up. And so you answer it, but it's a strange person on the line and they say, I have your daughter, I have your husband. Um, you need to give us money or bad things are going to happen. We're going to kill them. Um, and so the truth is nobody's actually kidnapped. It's all a spoof. They're not actually calling from your loved one's phone, um, but they're trying to make you afraid so that you will wire them the money. Um, so they might like phone you repeatedly, text you repeatedly. Um, it's gonna, they're gonna spoof your loved one's phone number. So it looks like it's coming from them. Um, and they're gonna try to get you to send the money quickly, like as soon as possible without thinking about it. Um, and it's very frightening when this happens. They're, they're now like, there's hundreds to thousands of these every year now in the United States. 
People are still falling for this. So what should you do if you get one of these calls saying, we have your loved one, just hang up. Like, I know it seems counterintuitive. You, you get this angry person on the phone saying like, we have your child or we have your wife, we're gonna kidnap her and like we've kidnapped her and now we're gonna shoot her if you don't give us money. But like in all likelihood, it's a scam. So hang up and then actually call your loved one and see that they're okay, because they almost certainly are. Um, if you do engage, ask for proof of, proof of life. You know, like I want to talk to my child or spouse or whatever. They can't actually give you that because they don't have the person. So that's going to be one of the, the signs this is fake. Um, you can ask, quest ask some questions only your loved one would know. Like, well, if you have my husband, what's like his childhood dog's name? What's his favorite food? Again, they're not going to be able to answer this. Write down everything they tell you, including the phone number they're calling from. Um, you know, if they, like keep them on the line and like, you know, write everything down, slow it down because they're going to want to speed it up. They want you to feel pressured um, so that you have to send them the money. And this is one of the ways you'll know they're going to want you to wire the money. They are not going to ask you to like go to the gas station and drop cash. They want a wire transfer. And that's one of the reasons you can tell, like they don't have your, your loved one. They're, they're from another country, most likely. They're not even in the United States. So do not, under any circumstances, send them money. All right. Thank you for your attention. These are my books. The current series is Ellery Hathaway series that starts with the vanishing season on the far side there. Um, no Mercy, All the Best Lies, and then the most current one in that series is Every Waking Hour. That's the one I talked about, about the missing 12-year-old girl. That is out now. And then I have a new series starting in August um, called Gone for Good. Uh, happy to take any questions you might have about writing, about kidnapping, um, true crime, serial killers. These are my areas of expertise. I can stop sharing. Thank you so much, Joanna. I was riveted. That was fascinating. Um, Aren't crazy stories. Crazy stories, um, especially that one about Quinn. I know. Um, you know, uh, faking it, and and also we never really find out what happens to Robert Wiles. Yep. Um, I guess he's presumed. Dead. Him dead, yeah, that Toby probably killed him. Um, and as to why, uh, the best guess is the motive that they had that, you know, Toby was running things um, until the boss's son showed up and maybe he was in line for promotions that it was now looking like Robert was going to get. And so he just got him out of the way. Well. And but nobody, and he, he still claims he's innocent, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, we do have some comments. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, one person says, I'm loving this. Thank you, Joanna, for doing this presentation. You're welcome. I love to talk about crazy true crime. <laughs> uh, one person points out that, um, and I think you, you mentioned this in your presentation that you have an error in one of your slides. Um, and yeah. you wrote Tom's body was never found. But it's really Robert's body. Yeah. Um, it's Tom's son. Yeah, Tom's son. Um, let's see. Um, thanks for presenting those very interesting cases. Those virtual kidnappers are going to ruin it for the real kidnappers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no um, muss, no fuss, right? You don't have to go through the work of actually right. getting to somebody. But and yeah, it may it must work sometime where yeah. people can do it. Well, it's very scary, right? Like you're just sitting at home or at work or whatever, and your phone rings and it's somebody saying, like, we have your child, we have your loved one, you know, your husband, wife, whatever, like your immediate panic is, oh God, like you want, you want to help them. And so yeah. you're gonna do whatever the voice on the phone says to do. And it looks like the call is coming from your relative. So you think, oh, they do have my loved one. Um, when in fact they they do not. 
Um, thank you for your awesome presentation. Very riveting. I'll be sure to start in on your series. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you, here's a question. Do you think Toby pretended to Robert that it would be a pretend kidnapping and then Toby made it real? I do wonder that. Like, there's no sure way to know because, you know, Robert's never been found and uh, Toby is still saying, like, I didn't have anything to do with this. Uh, but the conversation with the hairdresser, like, why would she make that up? And he said he had a friend who had this way out mm -hmm. um, and they were going to do this pretend kidnapping. So I do kind of wonder if maybe Toby was like, hey, I have an idea. And then midway through, like what a twisty book that would be, right? Like you think you're faking your own kidnapping to escape into your new beautiful life when actually your friend turns on you and like, it's, it's a real kidnapping. Yeah. So I do wonder if that's how it, how it was represented to, to Robert and why he went with Toby. Right. I think you need to write that book. I, well, it would be very interesting, right? <laughs> sure. Um, let's see. How did you come up with the idea in the first place for Ellery Hathaway to be taken by a serial kidnapper slash killer? Um, so Ellery is very loosely based on the real life story of Carol Durant, who was uh, a woman in the Ted Bundy serial killing story. Uh, she was 18 and shopping at a mall when Ted Bundy, pretending to be a cop, abducted her. And she escaped and became his first living victim. And in doing so, the investigators who were looking into her kidnapping and realizing that it has a lot of similarities to the Ted cases that they already had on their plates, started piecing things together about, well, maybe this is the guy who's actually killing young women similar to Carol in various states, Colorado, Utah, um, Washington. Um, and Carol testified like at his first trial was actually for her kidnapping. It wasn't for murder. And, uh, that was more than 40 years ago. And Carol still gets 15 messages a day now about Ted Bundy. So she's, you know, never been able to get rid of him. He follows her everywhere. He's been dead for more than 20 years. But like, I just turned on the TV the other day and there was poor Carol giving yet another interview about Ted Bundy. It's like every time the Ted Bundy story is retold, which it is every year, in a new book, a new movie, a new miniseries, a new docudrama, whatever, somebody has to play Carol. Like if it's not Carol herself that they haul out of, uh, you know, in front of the cameras again to tell her story again, then somebody has to play her. She can turn on the TV and see like, who's playing me this time? Uh, and so she was only 18 when this happened to her and whatever trajectory her life was on, she survived Bundy, but, her life has never been the same. And it became about Ted Bundy, even though he was captured pretty quickly after. And have you um, interviewed Carol? No, I'm leaving the poor woman alone. Like I, she definitely in the later interviews kind of has that desperation. Like maybe we can finally be done with this now. Mm. Um, and so, no, I would never, I mean, Ella is just the idea of, of having a serial killer derail your life like this at a young age and having to figure out who you are separate from his story that the public is always hungry to relive and hear more about and read a new book and see the movie and you're just like trying to live your life. So it's just the idea of this that's borrowed from Carol's story. I'm not trying to tell Carol's personal story. None of the details are the same. Um, it's just the idea that inspired Ellery. Poor Carol, I just, I wish her peace. Yes, yes. Um, one person says, great talk, so interesting, and you have such energy telling it. Oh, thank you. Um, another person says, wonderful presentation, thank you. And by the way, your books are terrific. You're definitely one of my favorite crime writers. Oh, thank you so much. That must be good to hear. 
Oh, it's always, always great to hear. Yeah. Um, and uh, the person who asked about the um, inspiration for Ellery um, also wants to know if the character of Reed Markham is loosely based on anyone. Yes, um, very, I mean, again, just the idea uh, also from the Ted Bundy story, um, Robert Keppel, who he was the Seattle homicide detective who caught the Ted Bundy case um, when it was just some missing young women. They didn't know the scope of what it was gonna turn into. Um, they feared that these young women were, were dead, which is why they had a homicide investigator assigned, um, but he had been working homicide one week and he gets the Ted Bundy case. <laughs> so he's another person that Ted Bundy happened to. Like he didn't set out to specialize in serial murder, which he ended up doing. Um, he was just your regular homicide detective, like early thirties, he went gray inside two years. Um, when they finally did catch Bundy for the third time <laughs> and arrested him in Florida, uh, Keppel was one of the people who flew to Florida to interview Bundy to try to get him to confess to other crimes that they suspected him of um, that they couldn't prove. So he had a lot of conversations with Bundy and indeed later when he went on to hunt the um, Green River serial killer as Gary Ridgeway. Um, so Keppel did end up like specializing in serial murders, he went back to Bundy and asked for his advice on the case. Like, okay, we're trying to catch one of you. Um, what's your advice on how to get him? Um, so couple, you know, he, he ended up living kind of the good side. Like it was very stressful, obviously, like working this terrible case where these young women were being murdered, um, but his career really took off uh, and he ended up again, like focusing on serial murder in a way that he, he didn't plan to, um, but Bundy came along and, and happened to Keppel. So Reed, Reed is kind of Keppel's doppelganger, the, the guy who's new to the scene and just started with the FBI when he accidentally almost makes this big discovery in the serial murder case that catapults him to fame. And that's the interesting part about Reed and Ellery is, um, they're both forged by this case, but they have very different perspectives. So she's the victim and he's the hero, or is he? Like he's always told himself he is. And in reuniting with Ellery, he gets to find out like, you know, how much of a hero he really is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so the person who just asked that question said, thank you again, Joanne. Joanna, and thank you for answering my questions. Um, I think I, I actually have a question, uh, oh. which is, um, I mean, you spend a lot of time researching true crime mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, you know, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> like, does it, does it, do you carry it around with you? Do you worry? Um, <laughs> no, not really. Um, I don't like, uh, any true crime that spends a lot of time on the anguish of the victims. So there's some, I mean, it's like murder porn. You can run across it where it's basically some guy torturing some poor screaming woman for like an hour on like daytime television. Um, I don't enjoy those. Um, and I don't really love crimes against children like it you know it's one thing if the child is dead before the book starts um and you know but like murdering a child on the page that's not for me and I don't really enjoy stories about that either but for the most part it it doesn't bother me um if it's not graphic I find it interesting um occasionally I feel a little guilty consuming it because one of the themes of my book is about how Ellery, who's based on, you know, a real life person who I think has in some ways been harmed by people like me who are interested in true crime and are the audience for this. And the reason that like people keep making TV shows and movies about all of this. Um, so I, you know, I get like, I occasionally feel that twinge of guilt and I do wonder mm -hmm. about the people who almost seem to make like a life out of it. 
uh, you know, the, the, they tell their story on one show and then another show and then another show. And I'm like, is this a way to keep your loved one alive? Mm. You know, like that's really sad in a way, but you know, if you, if you have somebody in your life who died, like after a while, nobody talks about them anymore. You know, like they, they're not around to keep telling new stories about. So nobody met, nobody says their name, nobody brings them up. And then along comes, you know, a TV news or, you know, crime drama show that says, all right, tell us about your sister and how she got murdered. And at least you get to talk about her. So I have a lot of empathy for these people. Yeah. Um, and so that's the one part, like, you know, they clearly want to tell their stories, right? They want, they want the story out there. They want people to know what happened to their loved one so that they didn't die in vain or that somebody is thinking about them and knew what a good person they were or whatever. So there's that aspect too. Got it. Um, let's see. Here's a question for you. Um, how have your interests evolved over the course of these books? My interests, hmm. Well, I try to do something different with most of the books. So they each have a different focus. So like the first one is serial murder. That's the vanishing season. The second one is arson and a serial rapist. The third one's actually a cold case. Reed Markham, uh, his mother was murdered when he was a baby. And, you know, that's been more than 40 years and he's never found out what happens to her. So he goes back and tries to figure out what happened. These very cold cases and how they get solved. Um, that part is interesting to me. The cold cases tend to get solved like by one of two means. Um, one, DNA. Um, and two, somebody talks, finally. Like these tend to be the two ways that cold cases, like the answer's usually in the file somewhere when they, they pull it out. And it's just trying to figure out like who didn't talk way back at the time of the crime because they felt like they couldn't say it um, that might be willing to talk now or what piece of evidence haven't we tested um, that we might be able to run a DNA test on. Um, so for that book, I, I looked into those kind of crimes and those, how those cases are solved. And then book four is the kidnapping um, or disappearance of 12 year old Chloe. Um, and uh, it's loosely based on or inspired by a, a true crime that's actually not a kidnapping because there's, there's two cases in the book. Um, and one involves the murder of a housekeeper and a 12 year old boy sort of before the book starts many years ago. And that's based on a, on a true case. Um, and then uh, book five, which is coming next year um, for Reed and Ellery is um, Coben is, that's the serial killer that attacked Ellery is willing to maybe talk mm. and say where the other victims are that he's never claimed, but only if Ellery comes to see him. So this is the sort of confrontation of the big bad, the demon that's driven her life. Mm -hmm. And can she finally put him to bed and maybe do some good um, by bringing some of these other girls home? Um, so this is like each book brings its new challenges, new ideas, um, and it causes me to go down new paths for researching. Um, I spent a bunch of time looking at how internal affairs are run for the book that I'm writing now, like cops investigating other cops, uh, which is not something I knew a lot about before then. So that was really interesting. Uh, but in each new book is like a new, a new journey. Yeah. And I'll keep writing them as long as they let me. And then for your new series, mm -hmm. that's still true crime related? Um, yup. So Gone for Good is, uh, I think it's a pretty fun one. <laughs> um, it's back to serial murder. Uh, there was a, a serial killer in Chicago who murdered seven women, ritually binding them and then sending love letters to the local papers about them. And he killed seven women and then disappeared. 20 years. Nobody, they can't find him. They're like, did he die? Did he, is he in prison? Like, what, where did he go? Um, and there's a local sleuth group who uh, is made up of amateur detectives. And one of them is a grocery store manager named Grace. And she thinks she has a way to figure out who he is. 
And she starts down this path of, of unearthing him. And then she ends up dead, just like all the seven women from 20 years ago. And so the detective in the case, Annalisa Vega, um, has to work Grace's murder and figure out like, did she actually unearth this cold case serial killer somehow? Or did somebody in her life use her weird hobby to murder her? Um, so I think it's, you get both perspectives. They're kind of, Annalise is the current one working forward to try to figure out what happened to Grace and Grace's notes are in the book too of how she was trying to get, figure out like who the serial killer was and eventually the two of them meet for the solution. Wow. So that's gone for good. It comes out in August. Available for pre-order now. <laughs> Great. Uh, that's, it's, it's a little teaser for your next book. Um, and I think this is probably the, let's see. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Do you have a particular case that is most intriguing to you? Oh, yes. So I, I may have talked about it before here. I, I don't know. Um, Diane Kine, she was um, strangled to death in her own home uh, some years ago now. Um, and two people were home with her. One of them did it. We don't know which. Like we get out of all the possible suspects of people who have killed this poor woman it was one of the two people in the house. So we can narrow it down to two, but because we can't get closer than that, they both go free. So they are, they were her adult son, Kevin, um, and her husband, Bill. Bill was not Kevin's dad. He was a more recent marriage for Diane. And um, I guess Kevin was a source of conflict. He had a temper. They called the cops on him before and Diane had threatened to kick him out of the house. So that's his motive. And Bill like doesn't seem like he had a motive except he gets the insurance money. And what happened was one day Diane died and uh, both Bill and Kevin who hated each other uh, called 911 at the same time to say the other one did it. And the police arrived and found the two of them grappling on the front lawn, like fighting, both saying, you killed Diane, you killed Diane. And the cops are like, eh? Then when the forensic evidence does not really help, like it points equally to both of them. They both lived in the house. Uh, one of them did it. Which one? Wow. Wow. Probably. That's what I'm, I'm, that's the husband. Um, Cause it turns out Bill had a first dead wife and you kind of get one weirdly dead wife. That's all you get. Like uh, the second one, it starts to look bad for you. Right. And uh, his first wife was like 30 something. And supposedly she woke up in the middle of the night, went out to the pool, fell down, hit her head and died. Hmm. And it was ruled an accident, but 30 year old women who are neurologically healthy don't usually wake up in the middle of the night, go out to the pool, fall down and hit their heads and die. Yeah. And if they do, their husbands don't then have a second dead wife um, where they collect, cause he collected all the insurance money on the first one and he collected all the insurance money on the second one cause the cops arrested Kevin and they actually tried him and he was convicted, I think. And then um, he got a second trial and it was a mistrial or like it was, there was no verdict, like the jury was hung, they let him go. Um, there is a postscript. Kevin has a third dead wife, or excuse me, Bill has a third dead wife since then. I'm telling you, it was Bill. <laughs> I, I believe you 100%. Yeah, it was totally Bill, but the cops actually arrested Kevin. They just didn't like him. Like he had a temper, he's not a very likable person. Um, but interesting, this is up on my website and I had to turn off commenting because so many people like see it on TV and they rush to my website and like, they're like, okay, I, here's my theory. And like Kevin, actually the son contacted me and he's like, can you help me? I have no money and I can tell you all the details. It was totally Bill that did it. And I feel so terrible about for this poor man, but at the same time, no, I'm not getting any closer involved in this story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but yeah, everybody's on the internet now. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. 
And the other weird postscript, so um, one of the people at my publisher, um, her dad was in an accident in Florida. I think we're seeing a theme here um, <laughs> where he was on his bike and some guy hit it. He was, uh, he had minor injuries. Um, the guy was Bill, Bill Kine. Yeah, so he was gonna stay in charge for that finally. I'm telling you, Bill is out there criming. I'm convinced of it. But the case is unsolved. I don't think it ever will be because Bill and Kevin are reasonable doubt for one another. But I find this case fascinating because out of everybody in the world, you can narrow it down to these two people and it's still not enough. That is, that is fascinating. It is a weird case, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> uh, someone writes it's always the husband <laughs> yeah exactly right like it I mean kids do kill their parents but compared to spouses killing each other and in particular men killing their wives like it's very rare like it does happen but it's pretty rare that kids actually kill their parents yeah yeah so that's another point in Bill's favor it was Bill yeah. I'm telling you it was Bill people on my website are like divided they're like mm, I don't know it could be Kevin <laughs> I had to turn off the comments because it was like <laughs> it's out of control. That's great. I'm going to go check that out. Um, well, I think that's the end of our questions and the end of our evening. Um, but I want to thank you so much. This was fascinating. And I think everyone really enjoyed it. I hope um, so. Yeah. So thank you everyone for tuning in. And um, uh, we hope to host you again for your, uh, for your next book. And I'm going to end this live stream. Good night, everyone. Night.